Welcome to Pittsburgh Chatter, where I do interviews where I want, whenever I want, with who I want. Today I have a special guest, owner of the Grandma Music Worldwide, Grandma Management, and Grandma Radio, Dion Dupree. How's yes, indeed. Going? Yes, indeed. All is well, my brother. Nice meeting you. Okay, so first thing that caught my attention was the Grandma Radio. So talk a little bit about this and how you got into uh, this field. So um, this came about as a result of um, conversations that I had with like DJs who wanted to get back on radio. So my partner, Nick Nice, you know, we had had some conversations in regards to him wanting to get back on radio after Whammo came back to the city, you know, because the original Whammo, you know, they sold it and then they brought back, you know, a newer version with new owners. And so at that particular time, he wasn't able to get back on the radio. So we were having conversation. I've always been a problem solver. So hearing their problems, it was like, oh, man, let me, you know, let me see what I could do. So I have a partner that's over at Media Famous, my man Domingo. I was having a conversation with him about it. And he's like, yo, why don't you start your own, you know, radio station, like online radio station, you know, online and satellite radio has a way bigger reach than terrestrial radio anyway. So um, I looked into it and, you know, decided to invest in it. And when it came through, I was like, yo, bro, y'all can get back on radio. You know what I mean? Here's your time. And um, unfortunately, things didn't, you know, manifest the way we had, had um, you know, wanted it to. So I was just stuck with having, you know, all this equipment and, you know, website access, the whole web build out and all that stuff there. And it was like, you know, what are we going to do? Okay. So one thing I did notice is that typically uh, radio is all audio only, but you kind of switched and kind of wanted to tap into the video side and also like the podcasting side and kind of merge the two. Right. So tell me why you did this specifically. So um, I can't necessarily take 100% credit for that. You know, my brother Mook, um, when, when things didn't work out with Nick Nice, my brother Mook, my man Malachi, he ended up um, coming on as the program director, and he started putting together shows um, like Unfiltered and, and different little um, the Detour show. He was coming up with shows to run on the radio, and a lot of them were incorporating you know the video aspect into it. Yeah, these segments. Yeah, these were, shows, yeah, these, yeah, these were okay. whole shows, okay, gotcha, whole gotcha. shows, um, half an hour hour shows that we were um, broadcasting live on the radio, but you could also watch them live on social media. So I seen like the evolution of social media, you know, being able to be that bridge. So we started doing, you know, all of our shows that way. And so I just kind of kept that same that same process because I know, you know, hearing a voice is one thing, but seeing a person is something different. And when you're able to bring that together, you know, it was super dope. So it was like we're getting listeners in other countries. You know what I mean? And, and you know, we're pulling up the analytics and we got listeners in Ukraine and Russia and and, you know, Afghanistan and Egypt and all over the place. And it's just like, you know what I mean? They're, they're hearing the audio, but now they can tap on to the live streams the on point. social media and see what's going on. So we kept it that way. And that's the reason why we um, went with Grandma Radio Live. You know what I mean? We, we did a whole marketing and branding restructure after we realized we were going to keep the focus on live. You know what I mean? Everything being live down here. Okay, so one thing I was confused about when I was watching it is, Okay, so there's the My Two Cents. Correct. Is, is that a part of the Grind Mode? Like, is that like a segment on Grind Mode? Or? Yeah, so it's a radio, it's a show. It's a show okay. that's on Grind Mode Radio Live. So Grind Mode Radio Live is just the radio platform. And the, it, oh, this is just the so platform. So it's not the actual show. It's not the actual show. Okay, okay. No, no. So on the platform, there are multiple shows. So My Two Cents is a show that um, was brought to us by um, the, the, the founder of it, Erica, Miss Erica Ray. Um, she came up to me and was like, yo, I got this idea. I was doing this as a street podcast, but, you know, I couldn't get people to stick with me. So, you know, what do you think about putting it on the radio? I said, it was a great idea. Let's go ahead and do it. So we've been running that for almost two years. Okay. So how does the ground mode crew work and how do you like process interviews and things like that? Because some days like I'll, I'll watch it and I'll see that it's just you guys, like the, the same crew. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you'll have like a special guest or somebody that you're interviewing that's sitting on it. So how does that work? So it all depends on the show host, right? So um, I give people cre like complete control over their content, right? So my two cents is Erica's show. Okay. I'm an engineer on the show, and I just help with the structure and That's things that why I you're mentioned. always in the back end, right. kind of letting them right. move more forward. Right, exactly, okay. exactly. And so they pick who they want to interview. They reach out to who they're going to interview. They bring them down and all that stuff there. You know, I just, you know, make sure everything is available for them. Now, for the OMG interviews, now, those are the on my grind interviews that I do. Mm -hmm. um, we're just getting no start. As a matter of fact, I got one this evening. Um, those, I reach out to people and okay. set up interviews. Personally. Personal. Okay. Yep, yep. 
Or if somebody reaches out to me, you know, I'll look into what it is they got going and then schedule their interview. Okay. So this may have, this happens in business and which we'll get into the business side of mm -hmm. things. But this also just happens when you're doing things like radio, podcasting, interviews of any form of fashion, talk shows, any form of fashion, late and cancellations. I've dealt with this consistently. And I'm not talking about like the 15, the 20, the grace <laughs> period. Right. I'm talking about actual cancellations 10 minutes before stuff like that. So how do you process this? How do you deal with things like this? So um, we'll, I mean, we we're just going to put it out there. Okay. So mm -hmm. if you've been paying attention to my two cents, as you know, we've had three different days. Three different times. <laughs> um, and a lot of that is behind, like you said, you know, people being late. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of try to get them to understand the importance of, like, being able to to be consistent. Because consistency is what ultimately brings everything in, right? It brings the viewers in. It brings the revenue in. And if you're not being consistent, people will look, oh, it ain't there, you know, and keep it pushing. Mm -hmm. So I try to teach people, you know what I mean, Um on how to professionally conduct themselves when it comes down to like radio and podcasting. Now, when I'm doing interviews myself, if a person gives me like a no call, no show, you're going to have to pay me for my time. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like if I'm reaching out as a courtesy to give you an opportunity to pop your shit and you don't follow through on your end and then come back like, Hey, you know what? Da, 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 I didn't, you know, Oh my bad. This came up. You didn't have a courtesy to call and let me know in advance. All right, well, it's going to be X amount of dollars for that next interview. People, okay, so I've dealt with the same thing. And people have a problem with that a little bit. Right. But one thing I notice is they'll come late when it's my money. But when it's their money, they're there on time. Exactly, I, exactly. Anytime anyone has paid, they have never been late. <laughs> they're always and, on and time. This is a message to the viewers. Like, this is the reason why content creators do what they do and charge what they charge. Because we have overhead that's related to being able to give you all opportunity to, you know, showcase your talents or showcase your business or whatever the case may be. And those are hard costs to us. Like, light, these lights are on. You dig mm -hmm. what I'm saying? This camera's rolling. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Everything is functioning. The electricity is working. Mm -hmm. Those are bills that need to be paid. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Those are hard costs. We can't get around that. Mm -hmm. So if we're putting a fee on providing you a service, like you said, a lot of times when they know they paid that money, they're going to do what it is that they need to do. And, um, you know, it kind of hurts for those who, who don't pay the money mm -hmm. and then don't value your time. You, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. there's been plenty of times I've been sitting down here waiting for some people to show up. And, you know, it didn't. But when they go to double back, you know, there's a cost associated with that now. But once uh, one thing I do want to say is once you reach like a certain level, which, you know, you can because uh, I'm not as up there, but they start to kind of respect a little bit more. You deal with it a little bit more, like a little bit less. I'll say right. that. I'll definitely say that. Right. Okay, so you do have a team, or is it employees? Like, what What would you say? Because I see multiple shows under your platform, which we have uh, talked about, and you're also doing management. So do you have a bunch of people working for you? And how do you do this, and how does it function? Um, I, I have people working for me um, under one umbrella. So mm -hmm. I'm also the executive director of a program called Safe Spaces that we run out of here. And so under that umbrella, I do have, you know. Um, oh, that's what the Penn Hills thing was. Right. Okay, okay, right. okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so under that umbrella, I got about 13 people um, that work with me under that umbrella. Uh, Grandma Radio, we did have a whole radio team um, that was in place to be able to help book shows, run shows, all that stuff there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but people's priorities change, things come up in their life and they got to move on. So um, writing through here is pretty much me just handling you know, the day-to-day -day stuff and making sure everything gets set up and ran correctly. And um, on the management side, I, I have an executive team. Um, but again, some things have, have come up that, that kind of taken them away from their ability to be able to be here as, as much. But I know that I can lean on them when necessary. Okay, so you do, so you have a team. Is there like three people you would say that's like having left and they're consistent? Like, yeah, you know I, I, mean? I would say there's three. I have about maybe like four or five mm -hmm. that haven't left that's consistent. Um, however, they that believe too, because that's a part of it, believing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think everybody that has an opportunity to come down and sit with me and understand what it is that we do ultimately buys in and believes like, oh, my gosh, yeah, this thing is phenomenal. It's just life be life in, you know what I mean? True, and sometimes, true. you know, family responsibilities come up, financial responsibilities come up. And like I tell people, this is a... This is a 
you know, you can you can make as much money as you possibly can here. Um, and you just have to be able to hustle and go out and make it happen. You know what I mean? No, but look, look, listen. I understand the life be life thing, thing and all of that, but no, nah, bro, you have to be consistent. And this is something that uh, people that when it's not their dream and it's not their passion, right. they don't typically understand right. until it's later in life. Right. But you have to be consistent. You have to show up. So when people aren't doing that, like, do you like separate your ways? Like, what's your way of dealing with that? You get what I'm saying? So, so in all actuality, I kind of understand the circumstances because you know we have real conversations mm -hmm. what i like to say is and i believe folkland los was the first person to kind of put this out there mm -hmm. that ground mode is a brand of bosses like everybody that works within the ground mode umbrella has their own business you know what i mean like whether or not it's joanna with her vision media that's her brand mm -hmm. her vision media and ground mode collaborate to be able to build her vision media up bring her clients and content and things of that nature and she in turns do work on behalf of uh, Grandmo Radio or Grandmo as a whole. Um, and so it's like those type of strategic partnerships. Um, but everybody has their own brand that they that they build up. And I work with them to help build those brands up. So when things come up, it'd be real. It's not like people just straight flaking. You know okay. what I mean? Not with my inner circle. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Not with those who've been down since day one that understand the bigger process. And... In all actuality, a lot of them are just sitting back waiting for me to unlock what's next. You know what I'm saying? They know that it's just a matter of time before this opportunity comes up and they're going to be the first ones I call. It's like a chessboard kind of thing. Absolutely. Okay. So for this year, what has been like something that you would say would be your most successful event or your most proudest business venture of this year so far in the 2024 In 2024, year? I would probably say my, my most proudest achievement in 2024 was transitioning the Safe Spaces program out of um, the high school and moving it into the community so that we can open up to more students, that we could work with more youth. Um, that transition was like crazy. And all the work that it went into, you know, making that happen in a time frame in which we had to do it. You know what I mean? Like Penn Hills High School decided to end my contract on June 30th. Um, the fiscal year for the program started July 1st. So I had literally uh, maybe two or three week time frame to be able to get everything up and running. So being able to fully stand independently of any other um, business structure was really, you know, monumental for me. My question real quick. OK, so the safe spaces is like you said, normally it was for just the high schools, mm -hmm. but and. I'm just kind just of for like, Penn Hills High School. All right, so I'm just questioning here. Did you move it to the community? Also, another reason would be is you're able to get in contact with the kids that may not be going to the school. Exactly, that's a huge amount exactly. nowadays. Exactly, exactly. So now we're not limited to only Penn Hills High School students. Now we we can work with students that go to the Entrepreneur Charter School. Now we can work with students who are in the um alternative school now we can work with students who are homeschooled you know what i mean mm -hmm. and we we have that opportunity to be able to uh connect with with more youngins so yeah that was that was probably my my greatest accomplishment so far in 2024 on the entertainment side um I, I have a partner up in erie my man um gannon with, with top floor promotions um you know he he had reached out to me and let me know like you know he was interested in getting into the promotion game and you know what I mean? He really wanted to step on it and, and, and make some things shape. So watching top floor promotions just manifest into like Erie's like premier event uh, company has, has been a tremendous um, accomplishment as well. You know, him and his team up there with top floor, they've done a great job with just, you know, connecting the dots and putting together the pieces. And they, um, you know, started out with, with uh, Skiller Baby. And then moved to Days Loaf and, and um, Jacquees and then set it off like a couple weeks ago with Sexy Red, Jeezy, Rob49, Tay Money, um, uh, Mooski. Like to go from an idea to being able to put on a massive production um, of that on that scale in a matter of, you know, a couple months. It's phenomenal. So shouts off to my man Gucci Gannon up there in Erie Top Floor doing their thing. And uh, it's been it's been a, a real pleasure with, with helping him see his dreams, you know what I mean, and and helping him manifest what it is that he wanted to do. 
So the per everything that you kind of do, it's like it goes hand in hand. It helps each other out. But one of the things, uh, the label. So do you have a label? Or I did see you. You kind of dove into it a little bit, saying it's a partnership with uh, right. In Grooves Music Group right. and Grandma Music. Right. So tell me how that works. So it's not a label, but it's parent company. How does it work? So so um, I had the opportunity to put together a label um, when when my partner Domingo gave me the the opportunity to get uh, distribution on a major level, and we did the partnership with In Grooves. We did the partnership with uh, Symphonic. Excuse me, Media Famous. Now we got the partnership with Symphonic. So um, that's your current, yeah, okay. yeah, our current distributor. Um, you know, I have uh, distribution through uh, Sony as well. My man Rob Schwartz, he hooked us up as well. So developing these relationships, you know, I did have the ability to be able to structure a label, but understanding the business and the business structure of a record label and how that imposes on the artists and the creativity side of things. I'm 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 an artist first, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I'm I'm an artist first type of guy. If you're going to be putting your blood, sweat, and tears into into this business. Then you should be getting, you know, everything you got coming to you. No executive that sit behind a, a desk that pulls strings should be entitled to large percentages of what you're putting your all into in the studio, so forth and so on. So I just didn't have the the mindset to structure a label. So what I did was I gave artists label access. So I used these relationships to be able to give artists the same opportunities that an artist on a major label would have. That's how we got cats like Folkland Los, you know, considered for Grammys. How we got cats like NFM Drama, OT Cali considered for Grammys as independent artists. You know what I mean? Because I'm able to plug them in based off of the relationships that I have. So I keep these partnerships in place and then we get, we got all the major distribution. There's not one store that we can't deliver your music to, even the jukeboxes. Um, but you got to be in position to take advantage of that. So you had the, basically what you're saying is you had the ability to kind of like take that role of leading artists on and just finesse it in the mind. But you said, no, nah, I'm going to go a different route and just make the connection and let them to make their decision absolutely, themselves. Absolutely. Instead of forcing them into some form of contract. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's crazy because I literally can use <clears throat> the access that I have to, um, the access that I have to like the celebrities, their managers, I can take pictures, I can be around, I could go to the parties, I could I could do all this stuff and sell it to a person who's looking to come up, mm -hmm. you know, looking to be in that lifestyle mm -hmm. and say, oh, in order for you to be able to get this, you got to do this, this and this. You know what I mean? Like I, I could do that, um, but I choose not to because it's not right. You know what I mean? Like it's really not the way business should be structured, but that's how it is in the music business. And but you said you're an artist first, so you're able to see it from that perspective. Right, right. And, and Which means, I'm not saying that I make the music as an artist first. I'm just artist friendly. Like, I think mm -hmm. as an artist first. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if, if I'm paying money to go in the studio and record this record, what would I look like turning over, turning over the rights to Dion Dupree, who's literally just making plays for me? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So with your process... And with your journey, who is someone that has been your, your quote unquote, we'll say like your Yoda, your mentor, someone that's giving you knowledge and advice? I do know you mentioned Domingo a lot. Is that the person you would say? I would say I would say um, Domingo and Nick Nice. You know, I mean, they're they're left and right hand. You know what I'm saying? They're, they they go hand in hand. Um, Domingo definitely has schooled me on the business side of music. You know what I mean? He schooled me on, you know, the ultimate like the game of how the game is played. You know what I mean? And he's given me the support for me to be able to stand independently and be able to make the decisions that I want to make and not necessarily, you know, lead people down, you know, the wrong road. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have very candid conversations in regards to like what they do versus what you should do. And Nick Nice, uh, he just instilled like the moral compass in me. Um, understanding how to treat people, understanding how to be ethical, understanding, you know, how to make people feel comfortable and value people as a whole. Things so, people remember. Yeah, yeah. So my ability to network and, and expand and the reason why we're able to operate in so many different cities and so many different markets, you know, I can attribute that element to Nick Nice and just understanding business, business principles. Um, which is basically, you know, common, uh, common human principles. You know what I mean? Treat people the way you want to be treated. 
And then as far as the education side and the knowledge that I have, as far as the entertainment industry and music in itself, I attribute that to Domingo. You know what I mean? He's the one that 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 schooled me on the business side of it and, and gave me a lot of opportunities as well. Okay, so one thing I do know this had to come straight from you. There's no way you like gain this idea from someone else. Is helping DJs with their events. That's not something you see people typically do. Right. It promoting anything like that. It's gotten a little bit better in Pittsburgh now, but I've noticed you've been doing it. Right. So talk about how you got into that. So I got into the business first from managing DJs. I, I came on mm -hmm. as the president of Nick Nice Productions. Um, that was our very first play. He 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 was getting booked so much. He said, you know, I need some assistance with. Um, being able to handle my bookings and, you know, promote me and things of that nature. And this was before he even had social media. I set up all of his social media. He didn't even had that in place at first. So um, we had a meeting and, you know, we agreed to do this partnership. And I came on as the president of Nick Nice Productions. And so that was, uh, you know, he had no sleep, which was about maybe five or six DJs that when he was booked, he would refer them out to, you know, for weddings, birthday parties, you know, anniversaries, all that stuff there. So a lot of times people thought they were talking to Nick. They were talking to me because I was doing it all through his emails. Mm -hmm. And then I set up his social media. So I was running his Facebook page um, and people thought that they were talking to him, but they were talking to me and I would let him know, hey, this person wants to book you for this date. I was scheduling his calendar and then I started doing it for the other DJs. So in watching them work and watching that process, I really learned the importance of making sure the DJs are straight because they're the keys to the street. They're the ones who is going to bring the vibe to whatever, you know, event it is. And so um, as I started to get more involved in that process, artists started reaching out like, oh, man, you know, what I mean, can you help us? Can you manage us? I know nothing about management at the time, but I talked to Nick because he was, you know, he had managed uh, F3 and, you know, was involved in Tuffy Tuff's career, early 80s and stuff like that there and um, early 90s. And so he knew the business side. And he was like, I'm not touching it. I'm not interested in working with no artists. I refuse to do it. But if you want to do it, I will show you everything that you need. And then ultimately developing that relationship with him led to being able to get a cast like Domingo um, and things like that. So that's kind of how all of that evolved. You know what I mean? Joanna was working with an artist and she brought him over to us. And um, I was working with Ray Love and Nick Nice. Um, Ray Love was on Whammo at the time. And so it was like we were trying to get this artist to blow up. And as a result of like making all of these connections, um, understanding the role of the DJ was like vital. So, DJs are definitely like one of those things where it's like it's never going to go out of style. Never. You're always going to need a DJ for sure. Never. And a lot of artists don't understand the importance of developing that relationship with the DJs. Every artist that I work with, I'll tell them when we out in the club, go go introduce yourself to the DJ. Go see if they drink. Go go, you know, develop that Just rapport. Song, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Because Forget putting $100 in his pocket to play a song one time, and they might even cut it short. You know what I mean? Develop the relationship. Have them tap into you. Have them understand who you are as an artist, because if that DJ's rocking with your music, not only are you going to get played in that club, you're going to get played when he's at a wedding. You're going to get played when he's at a birthday party. You're going to get played when he's at an anniversary party. You're going to get played if he's on radio. You're going to get played everywhere he is because he's going to add that record into his playlist. Especially if they like the song exactly. and it's their vibe. Definitely. Exactly. Definitely. I also noticed you worked with a few people um, that I know. If it wasn't uh, Graffiti Rue, my boy OG, Bird. So when you're tapping into the younger crowd, this is something that you don't see the, uh, more or less, I say OGs do. They don't want to tap in with the younger crowd. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed you do that. And you make sure to be able to also have content with them and also promote their events, help their events. So when you're tapping into it, what makes you be able to kind of say, no, I don't, I may not understand this, but I, I see it can work. I understand it. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I understand it. Like if you, but you know where I'm coming yeah, from. Yeah, absolutely, though. absolutely. And a lot of old heads, they definitely do get to that place where they detach themselves from their younger selves, mm -hmm. and and um, that's one of the reasons why I still work with kids. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I still have my nonprofit organization and do the stuff that I do for for the youngest is because I understand the, the importance of the youth. I understand the importance of the future. So when younger artists come up, come up and want to get the work, you know. I, I educate them on the business and let them know as much as I can about where they need to be. But I also understand where they're coming from. I mm -hmm. understand their plight. I understand their story. I understand their struggle um, because I haven't lost touch of when I was, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, 23, 24 years old, trying to figure it out. 
And, you know, like you said, not too many people are willing to do it. They see the youth and they fear them because, you know, they're violent or they're aggressive or, you know, they can turn up or anything can happen. But I see that as an opportunity to be able to properly guide them and set them on the right path. And like I explained to some of the business owners around here, like when you look at what these teenagers get involved in, they get involved in it because there's no alternative. Mm -hmm. So if you own a venue and you're afraid to open up for under 21, guess what? You're you're at, you're being a catalyst to the problem indirectly because you're not providing any other opportunities for them other than, you know, being in the streets when you could. And relationships is everything. So I, I've learned that, you know, when you when you have a positive relationship, you know, with the youngsters, like at the end of the day, I might have this problem with you. Right. But because I respect OG here, we ain't going to get into that here. Mm -hmm. I'll see you when I see you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then that allows me the opportunity to really gauge. All right, let, let's have this conversation and see if it's worth you getting into it with this dude. If you if you have the self-control to be able to not get into it while you're here with me. Let's see what we could do to get this all together. You know what I mean? So there's there's a lot of different elements that I bring to the table in that space. And so, you know, being tapped in with the youngins, man, I just, I just, I, that, 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 that drives me. But being in the schools and the community, um, early I said on, you do a bunch of things that kind of go hand in hand. So is it easy to say that they may keep you hip on who's the Absolutely. fresh artist or who's the newest Absolutely. artist? Absolutely. Absolutely. They keep, you know what I mean? Keep your ears to the streets. You know, mm -hmm. that's the streets. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? The youngins... They they got the post. They always um, know before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at every major corporation in America, they always target the youth because the youth drives the culture. And what I try to get them to understand is, you know, there's value to that. So don't allow yourself to be undervalued by not realizing that you are being sought out based off of your influence. Your ability to throw this on and make the next person look and see what you got on and be like, oh, shoot, I need to go get that, too. They understand that. That's why they target you with the fresh, fresh fashion, music, the whole nine, you know, arts and entertainment. They target the, the younger generation because of their ability to influence each other. So, yes, I absolutely stay tapped into that to that post. OK, in this space, what would you say was like your first big win? And you were like, oh, no. After doing this, I know I can do this. I know I can help manage. I know I can uh, have a radio. Like, how were you able to do all these things? I think know? the first big win was when Domingo and I partnered up and did the That's Hip Hop at the Homewood Coliseum with Big Daddy Kane. Um, oh, my gosh. I can't even remember everybody that was on that show. Um, but we were the first people to have the Juice Crew perform the symphony live. Um, and and it, was, it was Big Daddy Kane. Uh, cool G rap, brand new being in DOS effects. I think it was. Yeah, it was all of them. Mm -hmm. So we brought them to the Homewood Coliseum. Um, and and it was all like Domingo wanting to do something crazy for for Pittsburgh. And um, that's like what Homewood Coliseum. Where is that at? That's right there on on Frankstown Avenue. Um, it's closed now. Um, I think the URA owns the building. Um, but yeah, that was that was like that moment, you know what I mean? We brought the whole city out. Um, it was a, a epic moment in hip hop. All hip hop came down to cover it. The source came down to cover it. The who's who in hip hop Mecca land was in there, Raz Cast. There was so many um, hip hop veterans that was in there and it was a first for Pittsburgh, you know what I mean? And so that's really what got grind mode on the map. And then we turned around and ran it back with Rakim and KRS-One. And that was the first time that they performed together. And these first time performances is happening right here in Pittsburgh, in the hood I grew up in, right in the heart of the city. And so you brought uh, Rock Kim here, Rock Kim and Chris, and KRS one together. He's a um, legend. And KRS one too, but like Rock Kim. Yeah, my we, bad. We did we did him twice here. Yeah. Um, and so you know that partnership with with uh, Media Famous, um, and that's hip hop. That really you know let me know like oh shoot, and then being hands on in every step of the process. You know what I mean? Booking, getting the travel range, getting the, the, the transportation, ground transportation, the riders, uh, making sure insurance for the venue was taken care of, security. Like we had to handle all of that. You know, it goes from an idea to um, reality and then making sure everybody's safe. They come in safely, they get out safely. Mm -hmm. um, 
that, like I said, it was my first major productions. And so from being able to do that, it was like, oh yeah, yeah, we got this. So that also led me to um, being able to do it in other cities as well. So we, you know, we, we've done shows in Atlanta, we've done, you know, shows in Tennessee, Kentucky, um, Missouri, Erie, New York. That's when you guys, uh, Sexy Red was right, in right. the Erie. And that, it was killing me because everyone was like, oh, she's not coming to Pittsburgh. I was like, she was just in Erie. That's like, damn near close enough. Yeah, it's two, two hours away. But her show in Pittsburgh, I looked at the ticket sales. It's doing real good. Mm -hmm. um, so it's looking like it's going to be a dope event okay. here too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. All right. One Another thing. A lot of people see where you're at now, see the success, see everything you have going on. But it's a journey, and a lot of people don't get to see the journey. That's why interviews like this is a positive light to do that. So let's talk about one thing that you may have said was like one of your biggest losses. Because I did see in a couple of interviews, you were talking about how people finesse, people be scamming and things like that. So let's talk about something that you would consider your biggest loss, or not even loss, learning experience. Yeah, I, I kind of look at everything as a learning experience. But um, I've definitely had those L's, those moments. Um, I would probably say... Um, there, there's been a couple. There's been a couple. Like, um, we've had, you know, some artist fails, um, you know, some some times that we've actually been working on a big budget, trying to push things out and, you know, run into a scammer. You know what I mean? Somebody that, that sells a, a good dream. And so we sit and meet and be like, look, this is the opportunity, da, da 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 And it's like, all right, cool. Let's go ahead and make it happen. We put up the bread to make it happen. And it don't manifest that way. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I've, and then on the investment side, as far as, you know, throwing the parties and things of that nature. You know, I had a huge, you know, negative turn of events um, down in Atlanta um, with Safari. We just doing this pool party. We thought it was going to be the right move. Lost 17. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a situation with NBA Youngboy. Uh, my man Booney, he here right now, um, did the show with him and got straight scammed by the owner. You know what I mean? They pull, pulling out guns on us inside the count room. Um, so we, we've had we've had our share of uh, run-ins where where things kind of didn't pan out, but we learned from them. Like you said, it wasn't losses; it was just you know the ability to learn. And now you know you figure out you know how to vet people more more thoroughly, um, you know how to protect the bag more, and how to you know figure out a way to get to the wins a lot easier. So when you have situations like this that happen, is it one of those things you just like? In the moment, do you not get mad? Like, what, what's the feeling like that you have in the moment when yeah. something like this may happen? When it's like a potential loss, right? It's going that route. Um, without a shadow of a doubt, you get mad. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, like you know, you you either lost money, you lost time, damn near lost your life. Like, you know what I mean? There's a lot. There's a lot that's that that you know you have to process in that space. Then it's like, you know, you're dealing with people from out of town. So it's like, did they scam us? You know what I mean? Or did they not know? Did they, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whatever. And so um, I know for me, it was very hard to see everybody that came from Pittsburgh and the surrounding areas down to Atlanta party after that event. So we still, you know, went to the Airbnb. People still had a good time and was turning up. And I'm sitting there trying my best not to splow everybody because I'm butthurt <laughs> about all the money that I lost and the travel that, that I have to put in. And there's, there's other people that I'm relying on as well. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't the only person who put my bread into that. And so not seeing them made whole, knowing that I got to pay back some bread that I used to be able to make it happen, not being able. So all this stuff is running through your head while Shorty's twerking over here, homie drinking over there, Shorty smoking this. You know what I mean? They popping pills. They having a great time in their life. And you just sitting there. In like, your head, just thinking. Y'all wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for me. <laughs> the fuck? Like, Y'all better cool out. Um, but you can't do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's, it, it comes with the business. It mm -hmm. comes with the business. So, um and yeah, you know, it, and then when you sit in a meeting with somebody and they've sold you a great story, you think it's the move and you you pay the people what they ask and then nothing that they say manifests. You sitting there, you know, especially when you're doing it on behalf of an artist and they're looking at you like, bro, I thought you said this was the move. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I thought it was too. You know, you, you got to be able to, you know, hold your head high through those, through those challenges. But that goes back to what I was saying about relationships. When you have like quality relationships with people 
and they understand who you are, they know that it's not you. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I'm I'm in the same boat with with them. And I made it a point to make sure that I value the people that I was working with and working on behalf of. So that if 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 there were any hiccups that was involved, they know that it wasn't me trying to burn them. Mm -hmm. It was just we got to learn and figure this shit out. When you reach a certain level, it's bound to happen. But once you reach a level where you've gained that trust and you're like, oh, they don't play, they're serious about their business, again, it just happens less. You're also connected to a lot of celebrities if it's not you promoting their brand or helping in some form of fashion. So two questions here. How are you able to make these connections and get these connections? And the second question is, why don't you take pictures and stuff with them? And like, you know what I mean? Because it's like, I'll see three events and you're saying, oh, I'm going out of town here. Like, bro, take pictures. Like, but... Like, you can only be behind the camera so much. You know what I mean? Right, right. Um, first and foremost, uh, I, I, de I develop a lot of the relationships I have with the celebrities based off of my ability to get them, excuse me, get them booked in different markets. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to do that through strategic partnerships with booking agents of, of um, club owners and promoters. So in my network, I have, you know, people who own clubs. I have people who, you know, want to invest money and um, throw parties and stuff like that. And... I have um, talent buyers and I have the talent agencies that I know to reach out to that has access to them. So when we get an opportunity to come together and we're putting together these events and we got it all planned out, um, you know, I'm right there with them. One of the reasons why I don't take pictures with the celebrities is because um, I just see a lot of people doing it and it gives like a, a false impression to, to the average person that, this is somebody who can help them get to where they want to be. And I've seen a lot of people take advantage of people in that, right? Mm -hmm. So you you, you big homie, right? <clears throat> you might be doing security or, or uh, you might just be with me for the night. And uh, let's just say um, uh, Rob Fortnite is right here. He decided to take a picture with you, right? You post that picture on your social media. Yo, you trying to get motion, get in with me. People are going to see that picture and think like, oh, he's right there with Rob Fortnite. He could do this, this, and this, and that. And they'll be willing they, to put they all on the line thinking that you're really going to do that. Um, and I've seen so many people get burnt off of that concept. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and seeing people do it. So I just made it a point not to take pictures with celebrities. You know what I mean? Like, if, if, if you want to do business with me. We're going to get into like the real business and then you'll see who I could get you next to. So you're big on not misleading people. Yeah, like, absolutely. Have, okay, absolutely. I, I respect that. One, Okay. The events outside of Pittsburgh and the events inside Pittsburgh. How do you manage juggling both? Is that <laughs> difficult? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's definitely difficult. Um, it's definitely difficult. We, we like, have to reschedule. Like, you know what I mean? Things mm -hmm. come up. And so, um, you know, it's just a matter of just having, you know, discipline and structure. So this weekend, you know, we got a show down in um, Atlanta with Slime Life Shorty. And I got a couple artists from Pittsburgh performing down there. Um, and I got the radio station broadcasting live from the event down there. Um, so anything that comes up for this weekend, you know, I kind of got to shut down because that's where I got to be at. But that's where having a good team comes into place because if there is situations going on where I got to be multiple places, I could deploy other people to be able to handle those things for me. Um, but and, and again, it goes back to what I was saying in regards to teaching. Um, I'm real big on teaching people. So if we're doing this and, and we're in business and they're like my, my partner's up in Erie, like he got the game. You know what I'm saying? He got the lane, so he don't necessarily need me at this particular time. He knows who he can reach out to. He knows who he can get. He knows how things are supposed to be structured and organized and ran, and it's a no-brainer. So I don't feel like I have to necessarily be up there with him to help him and get everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, to be able to get everything together because we have spent so much time talking about it in advance, and he's been on point. So it's like, um, you know, and that's how I am. So I'm able to make things happen in multiple markets, um, I, I, I kind of feel like it's just a calling of God, man. You know what I mean? Like, God definitely got his hands on me. And um, having trust in the people you have stationed in that specific. Okay, yeah, yeah. For sure. All right, so a lot of collabs. Again, I have to, of course, shout out my boy OG. Shout out to you. Uh, him too, Truest Story. I can't remember his exact name. I went to school with him too. I okay. see you worked with him. You also worked with uh, Sativa Crazy. And you worked with Baby Egypt. But these are like, 
some of these are early on, like right. So when you're making these, who's tapping you in? They're actually reaching out, um, oh. or or they'll see me out in the in the streets, you know what I mean, or at an event and be like, oh, I want to be able to do this, this and that. Um, so I I want to I want to clear up like a little comment, just just a word. Working with, I'm not necessarily working with them. I've Collab. just provided opportunities for them. Okay. You know what I mean? Like for me, working with is a long term situation. Right. It's like. We're actually sitting down on a weekly basis, coming up with the game plan, putting his plays together. Da, 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 da. Um, a lot like Baby Egypt, he got his own motion. He does his own thing. You know what I mean? So I can't take credit for anything that Baby Egypt has accomplished. But you, inter- you sat down but with I, him. Yeah, yeah, I've interviewed him. Yeah. They wanted to do the podcast. I provided the opportunity for them to do the Bird Top podcast. Okay. He did. He, who? But he's not the owner. Because uh, when Give he away came to do the interview with me, the, the person he was with, Said the same thing, and then it, it's crazy how it all ends up being connected because that's under your umbrella, bro. Right. Talk. right. Okay. All right. right. Go ahead. I'm yeah. Sorry yeah. To cut you off, but I just said it. Yeah. No problem. No problem. So yeah, like people will bring ideas to me, and I'll help you know help them manifest those ideas. But like I said, everything that that baby Egypt has been able to accomplish, he's he didn't do that with me. You know what I mean? I do the super dope, um, and we've talked about working together. Um, but we've never gotten to actual work, actually working together. But mm-hmm. you know, we've done a couple events together. Um, we did some showcases together. You know, he got his Red Cup season going on. All that's independent of him. Like I said, he had um, a talk show that he was doing um, before with uh, my man. Uh, talk on it. What's his name? I got his face. Uh, DJ Gucci. You know him and Gucci. Gucci had the idea. Wanted to be able to have him on as a host. And um, they put it together, and it you know worked for a little while. Um, so I provide people opportunities. You know what I mean? You Sativa. Like you know what I mean? She's another one. I actually ran into her down in West Virginia. We had um, so y'all didn't even meet in Pittsburgh. Oh, you didn't even meet in Pittsburgh. That is, that's wild. Yeah, we was down in West Virginia. We had an event down there um, that one of my partners had booked and was DJing. And so I was down there, and she came and said, "Oh, you're grandma." Yeah. So her family, I guess, was cooking, and I got like some great ass food. So I was like, yo, you got to come up. And, you know, she said, well, can I get an re- interview on the radio? I said, yeah, anytime. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So we brought her up. Well, she, I think she's from Pittsburgh. So when she had some time, she came through and, you know, did And I, I'm not going to lie. She's big on trying to collab and right. reaching out. So definitely shout out to her. Another person at, um, and the only reason I know about the, these two brothers is because I interviewed someone named Icy Wolf. And he was the one who, who to- had did a song with them. I'm trying to think of, the, I can't think of the song off but. But the official manos, you worked with them yeah, too, yeah, and that's yeah. you don't see them work with a lot of people right, at all. Right, and it's almost like hard to even get in contact with these guys. Yeah. So how did this opportunity come? So, up? so the official manos, they're 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 their own engine, and um, their manager, um, partner, family member, my man Rich, he he he's like he's like a brother to me. You know okay. what I'm saying? And so when when he said, you know, he believed in his little brothers and he wanted to be able to make some things shake for him, I said, let me know what you need. And, you know, he 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 and I collaborated on some other ventures together and he's opened up some doors for me. I've opened up some doors for him and um, the relationship has just been great. So anything that they need, they got 100 percent. So that's all relationship. You know what I mean? So we brought them down here for an interview, Um, you know, from time to time. We'll we'll have conversations about the direction they need to go in. Um, when they brought Mighty Duck in for the radio, I mean, for the video shoots and stuff like that, pulled up on them for that. They allowed me to get a cameo in the video, so that was kind of dope. Um, even though I'm like, like you said, I'm a behind the scenes guy, so I don't be trying to be all dancing in everybody's videos and stuff like that. But, you know, they they wanted me in it, so it was dope to be able to do that. Um, uh, even all the bosses, they all made appearances in videos. <laughs> I done seen all of y'all do it. There ain't nothing wrong with it. Right. You gotta you gotta have people know your face and have your face out there for yeah. sure. So official manos, they definitely have have um a level of of um selectiveness with them. You know, they're only mm-hmm. gonna work with, with those individuals that they feel is gonna bring professionalism, you know, to the table and uh they're very passionate, you know, about their, their career. And as um Hispanic artists, you know what I mean, dapping into hip hop, like that's major, you know what I'm saying? One thing that I had briefly mentioned before was your interview with the Thousand Eyes podcast. I have two questions here. Again, uh-huh. I apologize. I try to include both in one. But so what happened with that podcast? And also, was that your first interview? 
that wasn't my my first interview. Like video. Yeah, first yeah, first maybe video, video okay, interview. Okay. Yeah, yeah, maybe video interview. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Carroll, he you know he's seen some of the stuff that we had going on. And um, he was doing the Thousand Eyes podcast at the particular time. And, he caught y'all um, early on. Yeah, yeah. He had reached out and, um, you know, he had talked to Lee. Um, and, and Lee's like one of my brothers as well. You know, that's one of my guys that I can lean on for, you know, some advice. We got some partnerships as well. And we also work in the violence prevention space here in the city. So we're real passionate of trying to keep the youngsters from, you know, getting effed up and things like that. So um, when, when Mike had reached out and said, you know, you you have some philosophical ideas that I'm that or or some philosophical ways that I'm very interested in learning more about. Um, you know, I said, yeah, no problem. And and he and I are are what's the word I wanna say? Um we have different philosophies, you know what okay. I mean, in, in in the business. And so, you know, it was good to be able to come to the table and have a candid conversation and be able to put some things out there um, and be able to make some things shape. And, you know, it was, it was a very good interview, very good conversation. I have a lot of respect for Mike. I love what he do. I love what he's doing for the culture. So um, wait, he, he, he stopped podcasting. So what happened with the, um, I'm not necessarily, I haven't seen him do, do the thousand eyes podcast. Um, Cause he, like I'm saying, but, he was early on. So if he would have kept by now, he yeah, would, well, well, I know that he's evolved, but he has his um, Charlotte's web. Um, company, mm. media company. Um, so they've been doing some pretty big things. He's done some major video productions. Um, so he's he real big. Yeah, space. yeah. He's real big on content creation. Um, he's real big on marketing and and um, growing people's fan bases. I, I think I just seen a post. Matter of fact, I seen a post um, with him. I believe he got a plaque from Billy Eilish. Mm. Eilish. How, how do you say her yeah, name? You said it right, Billy yeah, Eilish. Billy yeah. Eilish. You know what I'm saying? So I guess he did some work on her project. Um, and she she got commemorated for selling five hundred thousand copies um, in America and a million, you know, in other countries and stuff like that. So you know, what I mean, like you got to you got to be you got to be you know tapped in and plugged in and good at what you do to be able to be in them spaces. So um, you know, one time for Mike Curl, man, he definitely is out here making a difference. No, I, and I'm I had went into it like a little deep dive because I watched y'all's full interview. And then I had watched oh my god, I seen Benji on there. I'm like, what the hell? So this guy was really like. Mm -hmm. Ahead of the time with bringing the certain people on. Right. It was just crazy. That's why I had to ask about that. Okay, one thing you do well, content creation, pushing social, pushing on social media. How did you get so business savvy with social media and content creation? Um, I just understood the, I just understood that, you know, in order to get people to buy into what you do, you have to be consistent. You have to, and it has to be believable. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I just made it a point. Um, and it was actually an artist that put me on Instagram. At, at the well, That particular time, I was only on Facebook. And so he was like, man, you need to start an Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, you know, all right, cool. So I started Instagram. And, you know, I posted a picture. And, of course, I had no followers or nothing like that there. Um, but I, I, I was married at the time. So I told my wife I started Instagram. I came home. My clothes was packed outside. And so... Um, and like I said, I didn't know nothing about it, but apparently like Instagram was like, you know, the thirst traps, people posting all types of mm -hmm. pictures of, of their bodies. And, you know, I guess she had some insecurities about me. Before they Instagram. locked on. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, my whole thing was just, you know, all right, I'm going to show y'all what we do. You know what I mean? So I would post up the artist's artwork. I would post up their visuals. I would post up, you know what I mean? Their, their, um, their work and things like that. And so, yeah, it just became a, a habit. And so now it's just so routine and so structured that, you know what I mean? It's just become normal. Yeah, it just become normal. And so, you know, pushing the narrative is, is the is the key, though. It's like you got to let people know what it is that they're looking at. Sometimes people don't like to read, so them long captions, you know, don't always work. Um, so we got into the man behind the ground videos, um, you know, just to kind of give some more insight into the work that's being done here. And you run them all yourself, like all your social media platforms. Because you already said you're helping others do it. So, right. But if it's your page, all of it is yourself. And and believe it or not, there's a few pages that I'm running as well that... We, we, we can lay that for the side. It's yeah. cool. It's cool. I, we ain't going to put nobody... Blood. People blood. ask why I got three phones. I got two of them on me now, and the third one is recording on. But yes, so some one of my phones is strictly for social media, and mm -hmm. I have like the accounts to these other pages 
that, you know, when they ask me to post, I'll post up for them and, you know, put the content up for them. So as of right now, is there any artist in specific that you are managing? I would love to say yes. <laughs> I would love to say yes. But um, um, right through here, I can't say that there's anybody that I'm directly managing. Um, and, and, that, and the reason why is not because of anything like with the business or anything like that. It's just, there's a lot of other stuff going on. It's a lot with, of responsibility. You know what I mean? No, 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 not with me, with them. You know what I mean? Whether it's family stuff, um, whether it's them trying to figure it out, you know, a little bit of inconsistency. Like I'm still here for them. No, that's what I meant though. Responsibility. Not, yeah, though. they're not giving me stuff to manage. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if I don't have oh. a new video coming out or if, or if they're not letting me know that, you know, a new single is being released. We're not putting together a strategy. We're not, you know, figuring out, you know, if we're not meeting and having something, you know, tangible, then there's nothing to manage. You know what I'm saying? And so as it stands right now, I know OT Cali uh, just dropped a little video, um, a mic drop that he did um, with, his, with his kids. The song was super dope. Um, but again, we haven't had a meeting to see what's, what's going to manifest from that. Um, Folkland Los is focusing on his social media, so he's putting a lot of content up there. And he's um, going viral a couple times. Yeah, yeah, he definitely is going viral um, and, and you know, definitely making some dope content. But he has a show coming up this Saturday. I don't even know if he promoted it yet, but, you know, I do what I can to kind of put people in motion, but <laughs> that's no shot. That's no shot. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. you know, in answer in relation to the question, mm -hmm. Am I managing artists at this particular said, I'm time? <laughs> I would love to, but they have to give me something to manage. Okay, for sure. All right, Marley State of Mind of podcast. This is another interview that you did. And this is one of the things where it made it easier on my part to like do research and know certain things. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this. How did this uh, opportunity come about? Um, so the Marley State of Man, I believe... That was recorded here, too. Yeah, it? he's yeah. he's down in Uniontown. They, mm -hmm. they do that down in Uniontown. Um, I believe there was an artist that I was working with that did an interview with him first. Um, and as a result of them doing that interview is how I came across them. And then he's like, oh, you're working with Grandma. I would love to be able to get him down here. So he reached out to me and I just went down and did the interview. And it was a super dope situation. So I sent him a couple other people to interview, you know, after me. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, so he yeah. wasn't even from Pittsburgh. Yeah, he's from Pittsburgh, but the place where they shoot is down in Uniontown. Okay. Um, so that's where he has has his studio and stuff set up. And so yeah, it, it was it was a it was a dope opportunity. All right, I know we're getting to the end of it. I just got a couple more questions to get through. Just a couple more. All right, so when it you do interviews, but do you actually love doing interviews, or is it just content creation for you? No, I actually love doing interviews because I'm not the type of person that's gonna that that's gonna just outwardly pop my shit, so mm. to say, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not just going to be out here telling the world, you know, da, 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 da. Mm. Um, but when I get an opportunity for people like yourself to sit down with me and, and ask me questions, then I could be candid about, you know, the work that I do. So I love doing interviews because it gives more insight um, into the work that's being done down here and the work that I've, I've put in, you know, on behalf of the city and the region for that, for that matter. Um, and it opens up the doors for for future collaborations and opportunities. Um, I I provide interviews for people because I understand how important it is. So that's the reason why I do my OMG interviews. Um, but people don't always want to take advantage of it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So when you reached out and was like, "Yo, I'd like to do your interview," I'm like, "Oh man, I love it. Let's go. Let's go." Well, I have a I, people don't know I have a long list, and it's it's hard to get everybody down because like. Every new day, I have someone DMing me or someone saying, hey, bro, let's collab. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard. So it, on that side of it, it can get a little bit complicated for sure. All right. So how do you remain consistent? You're very, very consistent with the post, how you move, the consistency of the radio, all of it. How do you remain consistent? Because it's very difficult. And I know it from experience. It's my lifestyle, bro. Mm -hmm. Like you're, 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 you're getting the, the real day-to-day -day operations of, of what I do. I'm not I'm not pulled away or, or obligated in any other space than what those those that I, I decide that this is what I'm gonna do. So if I'm putting focus on the radio, we putting focus on the radio. If I'm putting focus on the artist, I'm putting focus on the artist. If I'm putting focus on the event, I'm putting focus on the event. Um 
because you know what I mean this is what I do this is my lifestyle and that's why I say it's not just the name grandma is not just the name it's a lifestyle mm -hmm. um it's representative it's a representation of the mentality that you have to get in in order to be successful so in order to be consistent you got to be in grandma in mm -hmm. order to 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 understand the assignment so to say you got to be in grandma you know what I mean so um, we're not a, a, a label or nothing like that. You know, I'm not a polarizing type of person where it's like either get down or lay down type situation. I'm real big on collaborations. Um, and so, you know, that allows me the ability to be able to handle the, the massive amount of work that I do. All right. So we got time to the end of it. And this is going to be my last question because I want people to actually know that there, there's more to work. There's more to outside of work. So what would you say you something you do on your free time? What's something that you like to genuinely do where you're like, man, all right, now it's time for me to just chill and do this? Damn, this question was asked to me yesterday, and I don't know if I can get the appropriate answer today. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be something, a show you watch, a certain album that you like to put on repeat, something. I did say you mentioned you liked Rick Ross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rick yeah. Ross is my dude. I do like I do like uh, music. I love music as a whole. So I would probably say something that I enjoy doing is like night rides. I'll, you know what I mean? I'll, mm. I'll hop in a ride and ride through the city, um, or, you know, in a car and just listen to the music or whatever the case may be. Um, I'm, I'm Because I'm like highly... Like a lot of people know me, I'm like a popular loner. So I spend a lot of time to myself. Um, and so at the end of the day, I've been around so many people. I've done so much in the course of the day. Sometimes I just need that time to decompress. You know what I mean? And so just, those rides are more like your therapy, your end of the day. Yeah. Right, let me just think yeah. and chill. Yep. Okay. Plan out the next day because the next day is going to be super active as well. Um, but, you know, I had my vices. Um, you know, I have things that I definitely have to have in place in my life in order for me to be cool. Mm -hmm. No drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that it's not nothing illegal, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, can, it can be toxic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, I think we know where we're going with that. So let's let's <laughs> let's wrap it up here a little bit. All right. So one thing I do want to say is I have seen your work. I seen what you're doing. You have followed me a while back. And I, as soon as like someone follows me or someone reaches me, I put that to the list. I put them on the list if I'm interested in doing it. Right. And then, of course, there's sometimes it's uh, vice versa. <clears throat> so I want to say is I appreciate you for doing this interview. I, I, I found like maybe two interviews that are video, two, I think, Voyage ATL. I might be yeah, saying that wrong. Yeah. I've seen that. And I've seen that. Um, But that's more like a blog site, correct? Right. right so I've seen uh, this. Uh, that was a um, phone interview. Phone interview yeah. that they end up okay, yeah, putting they in that format. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've seen a lot of the work you're doing. I was just like, I got to have them on Pittsburgh Chatter. So I do appreciate you for letting me come to your studio, recording this with me, and just uh, giving me the interview. Honestly, absolutely, man. man. Absolutely. I appreciate you reaching out. I appreciate you coming down. Mm -hmm. um, if there's anything I can do for you, man, just let me mm -hmm. know. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. All right. I appreciate it. It was a super it. dope conversation, bro. All right. That's a wrap. So all I need to do is uh, get a photo with you. And like, I can literally, like, if you can just upload it straight to the channel, I can edit and do everything else later. Okay.